Good afternoon. My name is Bob Steer. I'm the chair of the Board of Trustees for the Thomas Memorial Library. And on behalf of the board, we'd like to welcome you to Cape Elizabeth today for this forum on the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. Um, I'd like to introduce our moderator for the program, the chair of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council, David Backer. Thank you, Bob. Welcome, everybody. At its May 2006 regular meeting, the Cape Elizabeth Town Council authorized me to invite citizens to serve on a task force to plan for possible impacts of the Taxpayer Bill of Rights Citizens Initiative, popularly known as TABOR, if it is adopted in November. The purpose of the task force, as outlined by the town council, was to assist in educating citizens prior to the November vote and to prepare an implementation plan for the town council to consider if the Taxpayer Bill of Rights is adopted. Under the able leadership, guidance, and patience of Beth Courier and Janet McLaughlin as co-chairs, and are Beth and Janet here? Um, the 30 members of the task force have met every other Wednesday evening for the last three months to immerse themselves in the language of the proposed legislation. Effective advocates both for and against the Taxpayer Bill of Rights were well represented in all aspects of our discussions. During the process of discussing and analyzing the proposed le legislation, <coughs> members found themselves discussing and debating issues of economics, statistics, employment, education, state and local budgets, tax burdens, health care and health insurance, multi-year population and enrollment trends, principles of representative democracy, expenditure formulas, population adjustment factors, mains, past, present, and future. In other words, all the easy stuff. In furtherance of its goal of educating the citizens of Cape Elizabeth prior to the November 7 vote, the members of the task force, in conjunction with the Thomas Memorial Library Board of Trustees, are pleased to present this forum. The task force subcommittee responsible for assembling this afternoon's group of panelists has done an outstanding job ensuring a balanced presentation from both supporters and opponents of the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. And we are fortunate to have with us six of the most knowledgeable and articulate people who you could hope to have gathered in one place to advocate for their respective positions. And in the end, leave us all better informed as we head to the polls to vote on this citizens initiative on November 7. Um, I would like to introduce the members of our panel, and I will introduce them in the order in which they are seated. Um, first, Bill Becker is the president and CEO of the Maine Heritage Policy Center, which is the principal author of the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. Um, in 2002, Bill was the finance director with the Chinquette for Governor campaign. Uh, Bill worked in Washington, D.C. for the American Bankers Association, and he worked as a fundraiser at the Republican National Senatorial Committee. He sits on the board of directors for the Portland, Com Portland Community Chamber of Commerce and the Portland Conservatory of Music. He also serves as the vice chair of the Portland Chamber's Public Policy and Legislative Affairs Committee. Phyllis Cohn, sitting next to Bill, um, has been the communications director for AARP since August of 2003. She handles all of the traditional media responsibilities for AARP, such as writing press releases, speeches, op-eds, and organizing press conferences. Uh, prior to coming to Maine, Phyllis held the same position in New York City uh, for the AARP New York State Office for three years. Um, Phyllis has worked in marketing and public relations for over 10 years, including positions at the National Football League, the United States Football League, and CBS Sports. Phyllis lives in Cape Elizabeth with her son Andrew and is currently wearing Andrew's football jersey yeah, this afternoon. 
Paula Page, sitting next to Phyllis, is a native of Lewiston, one of, and Paul, you have to confirm for me that this is not a typo, one of 18 children. 14 boys and four girls. <laughs> and educated in the main schools. <laughs> Paul is the general manager for Marden's company and serves on its five member board. Um, Paul is currently serving his second term as the mayor of Waterville. Um, he is former chairman of the board for the Mid-Main United Way, Mid-Main Homeless Shelter, and on the advisory board of the High Hopes Clubhouse, a not-for-profit organization that assists people with mental health disease. Uh, over the last 35 years, Paul has taught many business accounting and finance courses in colleges throughout Maine and has conducted many seminars on business and computer technology related topics. Next to Paul is James Cohen. Uh, Jim is a partner at Verrill Dana, where he has been a partner since 1999. Um, he's been with Verrill Dana since 1991. Jim currently serves as chair of Verrill Dana's Governmental Strategies Group. He's a member of the firm's Utilities and Energy Group and co-chairs the firm's Financial Services Regulatory Group. Jim has been on the Portland City Council since 2002 and currently serves as the mayor of the city of Portland. He is a former president of Portland Trails, a nonprofit urban land trust, and is the founding president of the North Deering Neighborhood Association. Next to Jim is Scott Moody. Scott is the Vice President of Policy and Chief Economist of the Maine Heritage Policy Center, so works closely with Bill Becker. Scott has 10 years of economic policy research and economic modeling experience from his work with the Tax Foundation and the Heritage Foundation. Scott has authored or co-authored over 25 published articles and books. He's an um, adjunct professor of economics at Landsbridge University in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. And last and certainly not least is Charles Colgan. Um, Charlie is a uh, professor who holds the Russell Chair in Education and Philosophy at the University of Southern Maine. He is a professor of public policy and management in the Muskie School where he teaches economics policy analysis, economic development, and courses in analytic methods. Uh, he also currently holds positions as a research fellow with the United States Bureau of Labor Statistics and chief economist for the National Ocean Economics Program. He's also chair of the State of Maine Consensus Economic Forecasting Commission. Prior to coming to USM, Charlie served for 12 years in the Maine State Planning Office, including positions as Maine State Economist and Special Assistant to the Governor for International Trade. So we have with us, as you can tell from the credentials, six very informed people quite capable of helping us educate ourselves in preparation for November 7. I have not forgotten the two folks sitting at the end, both of whom are hopefully familiar to all of you, our town manager, Michael McGovern, and our school superintendent, Alan Hawkins, who are here to serve as resources to the extent that we need to refer to them to answer factual questions related to Cape Elizabeth. Um, they will not be speaking as formal members of the panel, but are here as resources to the extent we get stumped on any question that we need to have input on to have resolved. So thank you both for joining us today. Um, now, a brief uh, summary of the protocol uh, for today. Um, each panelist will be given five minutes to present an opening statement. Um, the order of presentation has been determined by chance, and the order of presentation when we begin will be Paul Page speaking first, followed by Scott Moody, followed by Charlie Col Colgan, followed then by Jim Cohen, uh, by Bill Becker, and last by Phyllis Cohn, who will wrap up on the initial five minutes each. So we'll take a half an hour to let them each speak for five minutes. We will then, in the same order, 
then let each person speak for three more minutes responding to what they have heard in the first round. We will then take a 10 minute break. Um, you have on the, hopefully your laps at this point index cards with pencils to permit you to write down any questions that you would like to have presented to the panel. During the 10 minute break the um, Library Board of Trustees will collect those cards. They will sort through them to weed out duplicates. Um, they will um, then present to me at the end of the break questions um, that they consider appropriate and balanced to present to the panel. Um, I will then take about a half an hour to present individual questions to members of the panel. The entire panel won't be answering all of those questions. Instead, I will choose two people uh, from the panel from each question um, who seem best suited to answer the particular questions. After we finish about a half hour of questions, in that manner, we will give each of the panelists a minute to wrap up, and that will conclude the afternoon. So, with that as our background, um, we'll begin. But first, I want to note that this afternoon is being uh, video recorded. It will be shown, um, I'm not quite sure how many times, hopefully at least a few times, on Cape Elizabeth's local access channel uh, between now and November 7. The video will also be delivered to the um, main uh, state museum where it will be available for other communities to use to show in their communities as well to educate their citizens prior to November 7. So with that said, um, why don't we begin and we do have a timekeeper. Um, Edna Doe and Ed will be keeping time and will notify the panelists when they have 30 seconds left in their allotted time slot and we'll notify them by holding up a card to let them know as well when their time is up. So we will start with Paula Page. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, I guess I was asked <laughs> to, to be here today because of a letter I wrote uh, to the MMA. And in starting my, in explaining to you why I wrote that letter, I'd like, to, I'd like to, to bring out two quotes. One is from Franklin Della Roosevelt. All we have to fear is fear itself. And the other one is by a good friend of Franklin Roosevelt, Winston Churchill. The idea that a community can tax itself into prosperity is one of the cruelest delusion which has ever befuddled, befuddled the human mind. And the reason I brought those up is Tabor, as it's presented, is not perfect. Uh, I've studied it. I ran information on our city about it. it, it it's not perfect, but I also, also believe that you don't throw the baby out with the bath, bath water. What it really does, there's many things about Tabor that is good. And the thing that I enjoy the most about it and I, and, I, and I approve of the most is if a community goes over a cap, they have to go to the taxpayer with the excess amount. I think that's very, very good legislation. Parts of it that I don't like is that every tax and every revenue and every fee has to go to the taxpayer if it's increased. I think if Tabor passes, I hope that the legislature will take a look at it and, and refine, fine tune those areas. But the reason I wrote my letter to the MMA, and it has been, it's been uh, called the disrespectful letter by many of the people at the MMA, is very simple. Franklin Roosevelt said, all you have to fear is fear itself. And that's what this campaign's been all about. And it's disgusting. It's plain and simple disgusting. I am a believer that there are two ways to motivate people, hope and fear. The MMA has chosen the latter. And the education system in our state's also taken the latter. The fact of the matter is, Tabor does not affect your schools, does not affect the public safety. And, and our superintendent recently said, 
if TABOR would have been in effect the last 10 years, we'd have lost $25 million in revenue. The fact of the matter, and going back and looking at how much the city of Waterville gave the schools, it was somewhere as close as $60 million. So he's saying that 41% of the revenues generated from property taxes would have been eliminated. I called his comment preposterous, laughable. And let me tell you why. The only way that could have happened is one, the mayor supported it. And it's safe to say for me that the city council in Waterville, Maine would not have supported it. They very, they're, they're very, very uh, happy to spend and it's very difficult to, to reel them in. So I'm certain they wouldn't have approved of it. And with the historical uh, support that the community has given to our schools over the last 50 and 60 years, there's no way the taxpayer would have put up with it. So that's why it's laughable. It's insane. What Tabor really tells us is that you can grow your budget from year to year at the, its current level, plus inflation, plus the increase or decrease in population, or for schools, it would be the increase or decrease in enrollment. In the city of Waterville, for instance, in the last three years, that would have allowed us to grow our budget by one point, uh, 103.7%. Last year, we reduced our taxes. The year before, we reduced our taxes. And the year before that, we stayed pat. And MMA is still saying that we should have reduced our overall uh, budget by another $1.3 million. It's insane. Taper does not kick in until such time as you exceed the cap or the assessment. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And before we move on to Scott, I need to correct one thing. As soon as I was done speaking and turned it over, turned the mic over to Paul, I realized that I misspoke and said that a copy of this tape would go to the Maine State Museum. I meant the Maine State Library, and it will be available through the Maine State Library for other communities. Anyway, that correction having been made. Scott, um, it's to you. Thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the town of Cape Elizabeth for hosting this important forum uh, on the Maine Taxpayer Bill of Rights. First, I'd like to kind of start on a personal note. I, um, I currently have three children all under the age of four, and I want them to, be, to have the same choice that I had when, when faced with the opportunity to come to Maine and enjoy Mainers' quality of life. I would like my children to be able to make that same choice. However, for them to do so, they're going to need a vibrant and dynamic economy here in Maine, because I don't know what career choices they're going to make, and I'd like to ensure that whatever choices they make, that they can pursue them in this environment. And I'm sure many of you, you have children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, who you would all like to wish they have the same kind of choice that you did to be able to stay in the state and enjoy the wonderful quality of life. However, professionally, I'm very worried about that. As a trained economist, I've spent over 10 years, my entire career essentially, studying taxes and its effect on the economy. And I, I'm here to tell you that taxes matter, and they matter a lot in uh, determining uh, the course of economic performance within a given economy. Now, recently, uh, the bean counters down in Washington, D.C., who track such things, found that in 2005, Maine's per capita income ranks 37th in the nation. Uh, two weeks ago, we were as high as 34th but they revised us downwards and we fell three places. The evidence for 2006 is not very encouraging. We still continue to lag the national average, which means the direction we're heading is towards the bottom 10 as opposed to the top 10. Now, ideally, we'd be, we would like to be rising because that's a sign that our economy is growing and that we're generating new jobs and greater income. Now, you're going to hear in the course of this debate a lot about getting Maine back to the national average in terms of tax burdens. In fact, LD1 uh, in recent legislation enshrined in this Maine law that we will get back to the national average in terms of tax burdens by 2015. 
Now, LD1 is not going to get us there, and I'll, and I'll give you evidence later as to why. But nonetheless, we've agreed that that is a important policy objective. But what does it mean to be at the national average? It sounds good, but what does it really mean to the average Mainer? So I went back and I calculated in 2004, if we were at the national average, what would it mean to Mainers? One, in dollar terms, it would have meant that every household, main household, would have had an additional $1,600 in their income. Put it in a more broad sense, we could have nearly eliminated the sales tax with that money, or we could have almost reduced by half every mill rate in the state. So we're talking about a significant amount of money that would go a long ways to improving Mainer's uh, financial standings. Now, this is also going to have an important uh, economic benefit. The Taxpayer Bill of Rights is going to boost economic activity in one of three ways. One is that under the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, 80% of all surpluses, that is revenue in excess of the growth allowances, must be returned to the taxpayers in the form of a rebate check. Number two, however, as the economy starts to turn around and improve with this extra stimulus, we're going to start projecting surpluses in the future. In fact, this happened in Colorado, who also has a taxpayer bill of rights. And what they did is they cut, in Colorado, they have cut their top marginal income tax rate now three times since they enacted the Taxpayer Bill of Rights in their state back in 1992. Now, the third way this is going to help is that Mainers aren't going to sit on this money. They're not going to stuff it under their mattress. They're going to either save it or they're going to spend it in the economy. That, of course, is going to stimulate the economy. And in the long run, that's going to increase the number of jobs, and it's also going to boost uh, per capita income in the state. In a report that I've done, and this, is, this report's available on our website, I've calculated in the first year of Taxpayer Bill of Rights, Mainers will have an extra $500. By 2019, that'll grow to $3,800. Why is 2019 important? That's also the first year I've calculated the Taxpayer Bill of Rights will get us back to the national average, a hiatus of 43 years. Now, LD1 says we're going to do it by 2015. If it takes the Taxpayer Bill of Rights till 2019 to do it, LD1 is just more of a long line of empty promises. And with that, I'd like to thank you once again for hosting this forum. Thank you, Scott. Charlie Colvin. Um, I'm going to speak, as we say in the legislature, neither for nor against. But I'm going to try and help you figure out how you should approach the question of the Taxpayer Bill of Rights as it may affect you and your um, uh, lives here in Cape Elizabeth. The Taxpayer Bill of Rights has two parts. The first part is an expenditure limitation. It requires both state government and local governments to not spend past a growth rate that is essentially determined by the rate of population growth or school enrollment growth plus inflation. The second part requires taxpayer approval through a two-step process of all <coughs> increases in taxes fees and other sources of government revenue. And to make a decision about this issue, you really have to decide how you stand on each of those parts. Though they are, they, they are linked in the proposal, they are not necessarily linked. Uh, one could have one without the other. First, the expenditure limitation. You can probably put yourself into one of three groups. One group is, I want to see taxes cut and I don't care what gets cut in terms of expenditures. In this case, the Taxpayer Bill of Rights is probably something for you because, um, as Scott points out, it will cut taxes over time, um, though it will take, whether you look at it, well, it depends on how you do the modeling, it might take 10, 15, 20 years to achieve its objective. But it will achieve its objective of reducing government expenditures and it will return money to the taxpayers. Um, so if you don't, it, it, in, in balancing the question about uh, how you ought to look at it, you need to look at what will I get back in terms of taxes and what will I lose in terms of government services. So one group can say, I want my taxes cut, I don't care what expenditures get cut. Another group could say, 
I don't know what's going to get cut, but I fear it's the services that I'm most interested in. And I'm not willing to risk whatever I'm going to get to back in terms of taxes uh, to lose the services that I am most interested in. Well, you're probably against the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. The group in the middle isn't sure which way it's going to go. They're not sure whether they're going to get back what they're paying, how much in the way of tax relief they're going to get. The legislation does not propose who gets the taxpayer back, who, who gets the taxes back. It simply says the legislature decides, and the legislature could decide to give the disproportionately to lower income people who pay less taxes but bear more of the burden, or upper income people who pay more of the taxes but bear less of the burden. Expenditures could be cut on fast growing services like education and health care, or they could be cut on slow growing services like higher education and public safety. Nobody knows the answer of what's going to be cut, reduced in expenditures over time, because these are all matters that are going to work out over a decade or more. So which risk are you willing to bet? Are you going to bet on the, on, on, uh, if, you, if, you, if you believe that you'll get most of the tax cut back and not have uh, the expenditures you're interested in affected, then you ought to go for it. If you're fearful that you're not going to get much taxes back and you're uh, fearful that the, the services you are interested in are going to be the ones that are cut, then you ought to oppose it. If you're in the middle, you're going to have to place a bet. The other part is the requirement that uh, virtually all uh, state and local um, revenue raising, taxes or fees, be subject to voter approval through a two-step process. One, a, majority, a super majority or a two-thirds majority in the legislative body. The other, um, a voter referendum. Here, it's a little more difficult on how to decide how to go, um, in part because it's very uncertain how this is all going to play out. The, Draft legislation itself is unclear on a lot of points um, that will affect this. Uh, and uh, let me just give you two examples. Um, uh, the, le the legislation requires that the um, man that the voter approval be by, um, and I'll quote, uh, a majority of voters in the jurisdiction. Does that mean a majority of voters present and voting, or does it mean a majority of all taxpayers, of all of all registered voters rather? I don't know, and I could talk to a slew of lawyers who also don't know the answer to that question. Um, another example is university tuition. Um, two parts of the, of the legislation say that tuition would not be covered, another part does. So this is a very uncertain as to what's this going to cover. I think that the basic issue here is going to be how often are you willing to troop to the polls to approve revenue increases at the state and local level. If you are one a person, a person who thinks every dime ought to receive your approval, then it's for you. If you're not inclined to do that, then it's probably not. Thank you, Charlie. We will turn to Jim Cohen. Great. If I could just pause one second, I want to bring a chart over. Sure. Thank you and good afternoon, and uh, appreciate everyone giving up a beautiful Sunday afternoon and uh, missing the first half of the Patriots game to be here today. Uh, I wanted to uh, weigh in on, on the issue, first of all, to say I'm not here to say that Maine shouldn't have spending limits. In fact, Maine has spending limits. They have those spending limits in LD1 right now. I support those spending limits. In fact, I helped draft those spending limits on behalf of the Maine State Chamber of Commerce. Now, I also happen to support the Main State Chamber's alternative position supported by the MMA and a number of interest groups around the state that form a powerful coalition that I believe will help to get, get things done. Basically, the goal is how do we take the spending limits we have and make them meaningful? How do we put teeth in them? And that's really what we need to do. But those spending limits are carefully crafted, they're moderate, they're reasonable, and they're effective. So the choice you have is not should we have spending limits in Maine or should we not have spending limits in Maine, it's which spending limits should we have. Now I happen to feel that if we adopt Tabor, uh, then we will be heading in the wrong direction. And I'm interested in hearing from the supporters of Tabor who neither want uh, service cuts to touch them, but they do want tax cuts to be part. And I guess I would suggest this, you can't have it both ways. 
And I want to turn your attention to the chart that's behind me. In Portland, we analyzed how Tabor would affect the city of Portland. It's going to be the same for most municipalities around the state. And as you can see, there is what I'll call the yo-yo effect. Under Tabor, every year, the amount of money uh, that a municipality can spend goes up and it goes down and it goes up and it goes down. And our budgets would need to respond to that yo-yo effect. But we know this. We know in a town like Cape Elizabeth that you're not going to get rid of a school building. If the school population goes down 30 students, you're not going to be able to get rid of a teacher over the course of 13 grades. So the costs stay the same. We're not going to eliminate firefighters because the same buildings are here. We know that police officers don't vary based upon inflation on an annual basis. So right off the bat, we have a formula that doesn't match the needs of municipalities. LD1 has a stable formula that tries to do what Tabor does, but does so more effectively. So that's number one. Number two is Tabor's going to force a vote every single year. Now, it may not be the case that a cut is required, but think about this. Every year, if you want to keep your fire service the same, that doesn't mean that you can pay the same year after year because you've got to pay those same firefighters a little bit more. Health insurance and fuel oil costs are going at double-digit rates right now. So just to stay level, you've got to pay a little bit more. To get that money in order to pay those firefighters and police officers, Tabor says every single year you've got to go out to a vote. It means every year we're going to be voting, sometimes once, sometimes twice. In Portland, the cost of that vote alone is $100,000 right off the top, lost money. So your choice is this. You can vote every year for the same things you would have gotten, and, uh, and you're going to want some of those baseline services, and that's just right off the top, lost money. Bond ratings as well. With that level of uncertainty, the cost of borrowing is going to be a little bit higher. That's just lost money. I don't think it makes, it makes sense. So I think the issue is this. Do you want a system that's going to hand to a minority of your council uh, or a minority of your uh, town meeting to set the agenda for the rest of the town? Tabor really is about governance. It's about handing control to a minority. I know in Portland we have many 5-4 votes. Uh, we need six votes in Portland in order to even get out to the people any of these referenda. So a minority of our, of our council could block something going out to the voters. So if you think that you want to hand control to a minority, that's what Tabor does. Tabor ultimately is a question about how do we want Maine to be governed. We all want lower taxes. Maine needs to have lower taxes. I suggest that there's a choice, and it's a very real choice, and that choice is do we want to have spending limits that are reasonable and effective like LD1, and if we need to fix LD1 by putting some teeth into it, we can do that. We have the coalition to do that. We have a legislature that will be motivated to do that. Or do we want to leap off the cliff and have, it's not a cliff as much as falling steeply down the stairs unless voters vote to override it. So you're either going to have service cuts or you're going to have uh, uh, no tax cuts, but you don't get both. At the end of the day, Tabor won't cut taxes, but it may cut services and cause a lot of unnecessary administrative red tape. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. We will turn to Bill Becker. Well, thank you very much, and uh, agreeing with all my colleagues on the panel, thank you for giving up a beautiful afternoon to, uh, to be here. And thanks as well for the task force and the city of Cape Elizabeth, town of Cape Elizabeth, for putting this together. I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, the reason that we're here, what the Taxpayer Bill of Rights was designed to do. My organization, the Maine Heritage Policy Center, is a nonprofit, nonpartisan research organization. We're basically a public policy think tank. We have them all across the state. We have them all across the country. Um, the folks on the other side are people like the Katahdin Institute, the Progressive uh, Katahdin Institute, and the Maine Center for Economic Policy. Our jobs, uh, respectively, on both sides, are to come up with policy solutions that will benefit the people of Maine. How do we improve Maine's economy? How do we get jumpstart what's going on? Uh, and we do it from different perspectives. Right from the very beginning, though, this organization said, we looked out there and we saw about 30 different states that had some sort of a tax and expenditure limitation law on the books called a TEL. 
Um, and we thought that that would be a good thing. And so we began research and analyzing what exactly a tax and expenditure limitation law would do. And as a matter of fact, we wrote model legislation uh, that could be used here in the state of Maine, thinking very carefully over a number of months as to how it would fit into Maine law, how it would work here in the state of Maine, specifically dealing with the fact that Maine has the highest state and local tax burden in the nation and has now for 12 years. That's not an insignificant issue. And so the question is, how do you lower that? How do you make that more competitive? You know, we understand the problems that we have. We understand that we have a struggling economy. No matter how, how, how you slice it, we've got a struggling economy. Forbes magazine just last month came out with a ranking that said, look, of all of the states in terms of their business climate and their competitiveness, Maine ranks 46th on about six different categories. 46 in the nation. So how do we jumpstart the main economy? So we wrote this as a way to jumpstart the main economy, understanding full well that we were in the state of Maine. And also understanding full mel well what had been going on for the last four years. Let's do a little bit of a, of a rehash of history. 2002, we had a gubernatorial campaign in which tax reform featured prominently. 2003, we were facing 1A, 1B, 1C. 2004, we had 1A again. 2004, we had the property tax cap. 2005, we were offered LD1, which promised us historic and unprecedented property tax relief. The vast majority of Maine people have yet to see any tax relief. And so here we are in 2006, having the same debates and the same arguments. You know, the, a previous speaker talked to the fact that the, wor the, the limits are working uh, in LD1. No, they're not. Absolutely not. They, they are ineffective and, and without any teeth. The original main state plan had teeth in them. They had an override provision in them. They guaranteed that 90% of the money that came back from the state to fund education would be given back in the form of property tax relief. That was taken out. Uh, we're sitting here again today, and all of you have given up your Sunday afternoon because we are still in the same position that we were. Maine's property taxes are the highest in the nation. Our state and local tax burden is the highest in the nation. That's why we're all sitting here, is to, to talk about how to fix it. And the idea that the same people that brought you LD1, or that promised you that they would solve the problem if you didn't vote for the property tax cap two years ago, are going to now suddenly find a way to solve the problem three weeks before the election, is, lacks credibility on its face. And so what we have to do is we have to say, okay, this bill, the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, which we drafted as model legislation and is now embodied in a citizen's initiative, has had about two years worth of hearings. It's a 12-page document, that's right. LD1, 125 pages. Okay, so this is a, this is a clear, concise, well-written, well-crafted document that looks at how do we get at our highest in the nation tax burden. Let me also say this. There are no cuts required at any level of government by the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, none whatsoever. The, the talk that has gone on from town to town, campaign to campaign about this forcing cuts are simply not true. I also take issue with this idea that, that either we can cut taxes or we can cut spending, but we can't do both. It's not true either. Let's look at Colorado, the state that has the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. In 1999, under the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, their state budget was $10 billion. In 2005, before there was any sort of vote, it was up to $17 billion. 70% 70 increase in six years. Finally, New Mexico Governor Bill Richardson came into office on the same day as John Baldacci, he's a Democrat, with an 8.2% top marginal income tax rate. Today, that rate is down to 4.8%, and they have a $500 million surplus. It is a false argument to say that you either have to cut taxes or you cut spending because, in fact, what you do when you cut taxes is you enhance your tax revenue with more people coming and investing in your state. Thank you, Bill. Phyllis. Well, there's a benefit in going first because you can stick to your original points. When you go last, you've had time to hear your uh, opponents and your uh, and your partners uh, talk about things that you might have already talked about. So I think the first thing I want to do is just tell you I am, rep I am uh, a communications director at AARP Maine, but I also am on a coalition of Citizens United and we represent over 80 coalitions in the state who are opposing TABOR. The other thing you should know is I'm a, I have a master's in social work. Um, I specialize in geriatric psychiatry, I work with children, I'm not a policy person, I'm not an economist. And so what I've tried to do in understanding Tabor is do it in a lot of plain English so I could wrap my hands around it. 
Um, I think the first thing I want to mention is I am not wearing this jersey just as a fashion statement. Actually, it's probably the opposite. One of the reasons I'm doing this, my son is a football player on, uh, on the Cape team, and they're 8-0, and, and I'm incredibly proud of him. But I moved to Maine, and I actually moved specifically to Cape Elizabeth from New York after doing research on schools and graduation and where kids were going to school and they're and their, in college and their reading scores, and decided Cape was where I wanted to be. I came here as a single mother from New York. I bought a house. I pay property taxes. So I am very much a part of this community. And one thing I learned about football is, is it's not really just about football. It's about team building. It's about peer building. It's about uh, community. It's about peer relationships. It's about role models. It's about all those kinds of things. And one of the things that I feel very strongly about where Tabor is concerned, and this speaks to a couple of points that Scott was making about you're getting rebates back, is what would happen if the budget was not able to handle not just football, but maybe lacrosse, maybe soccer, maybe the debate team, maybe the art club. These things that I didn't realize were really integral to children's development until my son coming in and not knowing anyone in Cape joined a football team, had a peer group immediately, and was accepted. Uh, it got me thinking about what would that have meant if I would have had to have paid for him to be on that football team if that program was cut. And that's what really got me passionate about it. Yes. I work for AARP, but if I didn't believe that Tabor would seriously hurt the things that we care about, like education, like public safety, like the roads, I'm discovering Maine and, and the roads, I, we go on back roads just exploring the foliage, I can't believe the condition there and they're wonderful and that to me welcomes tourists and makes it a place that people want to be. The other thing that's really interesting, and I'm shifting what I was going to say, is I was a little concerned, honestly, initially, because I felt that the panel was not balanced. Uh, Jim and I are obviously against Tabor. Uh, there's other three other gentlemen are for Tabor. And it was posed to me that Mr. Colgan was uh, a, an opponent to Tabor. And what I just realized in listening to him talk is, is that he is not either pro or against, but his statistics if you just look at the statistics, speak for themselves about why Tabor is bad for Maine. I don't think you heard him endorse or not endorse Tabor, but in talking about what Tabor potentially could do to the state, it didn't sound good to me. And that's what made me realize that's why the task force felt that he was an opponent of Tabor, because his documentation alone speaks poorly. I know, I don't know how many of you saw the paper today. Um, I think if you were home reading it, you'd, you'd still be home reading it. It is incredibly long. I want to show you this. This is probably, if you don't do anything else, if you don't, ah, if you don't read another op-ed, if you don't read the story about Colorado, if you don't read another letter to the editor, or if you walk out of this room and stop listening to us, I want you to go home and read this, t this legal analysis. It is written by someone who was paid to do a legal analysis. It is neither pro nor con. It is so complicated that I, who I think have a pretty good knowledge of what Tabor is, I didn't even understand a lot of it. And the reason I want to bring this up is Tabor is not just a sound bite. It's question one, and it's pretty direct, and I actually, there's handouts of the actual bill um, that are available to you. It's not just a sound bite. And what we've been saying is, is if you have 30 seconds to understand Tabor, you're going to vote yes, because it sounds great. But if you have 30 minutes to delve into the details and really understand how Tabor's going to affect you, your community, your state, then you will vote no. Thank you. Thank you, Phyllis. Thank you to all of our panelists for an excellent opening. We're going to move straight into the second round and give each panelist in the same order in which you've already spoken uh, three minutes to respond to anything that you have heard from your fellow panelists. So Paul will come back to you as the lead off. Thank you. I'd just like to, to respond to a few things I've heard. One is the chamber, MMA has come out with a proposal that is what we should all go for and vote against Tabor. Well, the fact is, Pileski, they did the same exact thing during Pileski. Pileski was defeated, nothing happened. And that's my fear. If Tabor passes, 
and the legislature is not bound by it, and there is a better alternative, then they, they can take the best of both and, and blend them together. But there's no way it's going to happen if Tabor's gone. Secondly, LD1 does not work. I can count on my hands right now, on one hand, how many communities reduce their taxes since LD1 has come in. In Waterville, we have reduced our taxes by 1.5 mills over three years. We have spent $3 million on roads. We've increased our surplus from 1.8 million to over $5.5 million. We have not cut services. This is what we did. We eliminated redundancy. We've gotten more efficient. My first meeting as a mayor, I had 15 department heads. Today I have four. 15 department heads, once a week, three hours, 45 hours. Four department heads, three hours a week is 12 hours. That's how you cut taxes. That's the real world. And if people tell you any different, they don't know what they're talking about. One other thing, in three years of governance, three years of Mayor Waterville, I've had one 4-3 vote and one veto. And the veto is, is the opposition. The city council voted to oppose Tabor, I vetoed it. It's my first veto. I'll tell you what I think about 4-3 government, 5-3 government, 5-4 five, uh, five, government. It's poor governance. You haven't done enough work. If you can't get to 6-2-7-0, our budgets in the last three years have gone 7 0 7 0 7 0. That's how we passed our budgets. But you've got to be committed to work hard for it. And if you work hard, you can avoid 4-3 governance. 4-3 governance is not governance. Is you're, you're, letting, you're, you're disappointing a significant majority of your populace. And it's not the super minority. It could be the simple minority, which is 49% of your taxpayers. So I'm not saying that Tabor's perfect. I'm not saying that I'm not trying to, 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 to get people to vote for Tabor because it's the greatest thing since peanut butter. What it is, it's legitimate. There are some problems with it. Doing nothing is worse, a lot worse. And you know, we haven't had Tabor, and we can do it. You just got to put your mind to it. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. We'll go to Scott Moody. Thank you. I'd like to uh, clarify one issue on how the Taxpayer Bill of Rights works. Fundamentally, the Taxpayer Bill of Rights sets into place speed limits on the growth of government. There are no cuts. In fact, I've calculated that under the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, Maine, state, and local governments combined will have an additional $200 million more to spend under the growth allowances, the growth allowances being the formula change in population plus the change in inflation. It's only when we want to exceed that speed limit that we need to go with a, a, a good, very good reason. Our policymakers need a very good reason to justify why taxes should grow faster than our incomes. And yes, that will require a two-thirds uh, vote of the uh, legislative body as well as a majority referendum. Now, let me give you an analogy of why that's important, why we need a higher bar. The Taxpayer Bill of Rights, I believe, is aptly named. In our Constitution, we already have a Bill of Rights, and they provide a wide number of protections uh, for the citizens of Maine. One of those is in law enforcement. Law enforcement can't simply break into your house anytime they want to search for evidence to use against you. They must first go to a judge to get a warrant. Now, a judge, that's pretty undemocratic. Here, we're going to go to a third party, objective source. The law enforcement has to present their evidence and say, this is enough evidence to warrant intrusion into your sanctity, your home, your greatest asset, and, prove, and, and, and convince them that that is worthy. Now, we understand the cost of this is that Yes, some criminals may get away for lack of evidence. We've all watched CSI and Law and Order. Sometimes the bad guys win. But that is an important protection. Now, your home is your greatest asset. Why don't we have the same protection for your finances as well? Why is it on the face that, that <coughs> tax and spending, as we've seen historically in Maine, should grow faster than our incomes? That's what it means when we're one of the highest tax burdens in the country. So we believe that we need to have a higher bar. And so this will increase transparency in government and give citizens a greater voice when it comes to taxing 
higher than our income growth. With that, I want to point out that taxes do matter, and many municipalities already get it. Tax increment financing gives tax breaks to select number of businesses. Now, they understand that to attract and retain and boost the economy, we have to lower our tax burden. The difference is between Taxpayer Bill of Rights and what's going on now is that the Maine Heritage Policy Center, when we drafted it, we believed that all Mainers need tax relief. And that is what the Taxpayer Bill of Rights is fundamentally about. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Charlie Colgan. Um, let me try and fill in a couple of things. Um, first of all, um, with respect to Colorado, which is frequently cited, I'll just note that in the um, 15 years uh, or so that the um, Taxpayer Bill of Rights has been in effect in Colorado, um, population, which is the growth, the econ the the principal growth limiting factor, um, inflation is true and it is the same in both cases, Maine and Colorado. The population growth over that 15 years in Colorado was three and a half percent. In Maine, over a comparable period of time, it was a half percent. So there's a big difference in the underlying number and, and population growth is not income growth. Um, secondly, I'd point out that um, the, if you're thinking about this at the, at the local level, you need to think about the interaction between state and local financing in Maine. Um, about half of every dollar you send to Augusta comes back to the local level in one form or another. So the limitation on state government also affects the limitate what's going to happen at, local, at the local level. We still have the two-thirds of the um, referendum passed in 2005 to um, Im uh, 2004 to implement in terms of funding uh, schools at 55 percent. So there's, there's, there's an interaction between the state and local level that uh, you have to take into account. Um, I agree with the point about expenditure limits and as a necessary part of government. Um, I proposed uh, expenditure limits for Maine in 1992, um, so I was way ahead of the crowd on that one. Um, I agree with, ta with Scott that taxes matter, but I would also point out that what you do with the taxes matters a great deal. And it is the balance between what you take out as taxes and what you put back in in terms of spending that ultimately matters in terms of economic growth. It is not simply the rate of taxes alone. Thank you, Charlie. Let's go to Jim Cohen. Two interesting, two interesting things I just heard. Uh, both uh, Mayor LePage and, and Bill Becker said there will not be a cut uh, if Tabor is enacted. That's a very important statement. What that means, and we found the same thing from the graph behind me, Tabor does not cut taxes. And you've heard it from the supporters of Tabor, Tabor will not cut taxes because it won't cut your budgets. So if you vote for Tabor thinking you're going to get a tax cut, guess again, it's not going to happen. But what you do need to understand is when you vote for Tabor, if you vote for Tabor, you are voting for a different system of having spending limitations. You're not voting to enact them for the first time, quite the contrary. You're enacting a different system. And as I just heard Mr. Colgan say, that system has very different implications. Now in Colorado, that state did have a system of spending limitations, the only one in the country that has Tabor right now. And we received a letter from the business leaders of Colorado who said, it's not working. Our business relocation specialists are sending people away from Colorado. We're not investing in roads. We're not investing in higher education. Those are the investments that need to be made to attract business. Now, recently, I was visited by the mayor of Wilmington, North Carolina, a state that's a success. They came to Portland and they came to Bangor because what they said is Portland is retaining its youth and that's rare nationally. Bangor is retaining its youth. That's rare nationally. We're doing something good. And they came to Maine to find out what we're doing good. And it's important to recognize Maine's population is among the most accelerating nationally. That's what the Brookings Institution found. Personal income growth has been growing among the fastest in Maine of recent years. Young people are moving to our cities. Maine was one of the first states to come out of the last recession. 
and we had a bad year in 2005, but the same Federal Reserve said, we're on the move again in 2006. In fact, projections I've seen from Global Insights say that states like Michigan and Massachusetts are among the slowest growth states, and we know that uh, uh, Massachusetts has systems of spending limitations as well. We need them in Maine. Spending limitations are important in Maine, but what's important is to have the right ones. And if LD1 isn't working right now, uh, then we can fix it. But I will say this, the Maine State Chamber did an analysis of, of LD1 and they found in the first year that it was working, that it was moving us in the right direction. Tabor, if we enact it, is going to take many years to ever see a, a reduction in tax burden. LD1 is going to take many years to see a reduction in tax burden. So it's a false premise to say my taxes didn't go down under LD1 because your taxes won't go down under Tabor either. But rest assured, your ability to control your government will go down if Tabor is enacted. Your control will be reduced. It's not just a 4-3 vote that you may uh, be living with. It's you're not going to even see the supermajority vote to give yourself the right to choose what's right for your community. Thank you, Jim. Bill Becker. Well, sometimes I feel like we're not even living in the same state. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know where these statistics are coming from that are showing this, this rapid and rampant growth and, retra and, and, and retention of, of young people. Uh, I, the Census Bureau, from 1999 to 2000, Maine ranked 40th. In, as, as in, this, in terms of its population growth, 3.8% growth from 1990 to 2000. In just the last five years, we're the second lowest natural growth in the nation, 0.94%. Our median age has, is, we're the oldest in the nation for the second year in a row. We're now 41.2. We were 40.7, now we're 41.2. And so this rat, rampant growth uh, that, that, that Jim talked about, I'm, I just, I don't, I don't see it. Secondly. Um, you know, this argument that, uh, about budget cuts. This isn't called the Government Bill of Rights. If it was called the Government Bill of Rights, then we might be doing something differently. This is called the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. And Jim talks about, he had a press conference earlier this week saying that if the Taxpayer Bill of Rights was in effect, he would have three million f d fewer dollars uh, in his city. Well, first of all, he's got a budget, combined budget, of $256 million, a combined budget for school and municipal officials for the city of Portland, $256 million. Second of all, that would mean that Maine people and businesses don't, could, couldn't spend their money more wisely than government could spend it. In other words, if we had that money back, what could we do with $4 million in our pockets just in the city of in Portland alone? What would we do? How would we invest that? How would we create jobs? You know, I think that uh, what impact would a lower tax burden have across the board on businesses that are looking to grow and expand their operations. Third, you know, whether it be Charlie Colgan, Lori Lachance, or others, each of us have testified that the current path is unsustainable. And what the advocates of, um, uh, the opponents of the Taxpayer Bill of Rights are saying is, let's just keep on the current path. Trust us, LD1 will work. Trust us, we'll make it better. These are the same people that have helped to create the problems and they're saying, trust us. Well, we've heard them say trust us for many, many years. For 40 years, actually, we've been promised that we can tax, spend, or borrow our way to prosperity. Even the Brookings Report that Jim references encourages us to go out and borrow 400 to 600 million more dollars. Are you kidding me? We have $4.5 billion of unfunded liability in our health insurance system. We have a $570 million structural deficit. And we're going to go out and borrow 400, 600 more? I don't think so. And finally, talking about Colorado, and I hope we can get into it in the Q&A. Look, the business leaders of Colorado, I'll read to you from the Denver Metro website. Colorado provides a competitive tax structure that rewards investments in business innovation. It doesn't sound like they're discouraged by their own tax rate. They have one of the lowest state and local tax burdens in the country. Hundreds of thousands of jobs have been created there over the course of the last 15 years. Thank you, Bill. We'll turn to Phyllis <laughs> Cohn, who will have the last word before our 10-minute break. Good. I do at home, too, I think. Um, okay. I'll, I wasn't going to do Colorado, but I'll do it really quickly. Uh, and as I said, I'm not an economist, and I'm not a statistic statistician. So I've got statistics that I can use on Colorado. I can look at a survey. Anyone knows that you can interpret results the way that's going to prove your point. But here's the bottom line where Colorado's concerned. After 12 years of Tabor, 
the voters voted to suspend the rebate portion. That's a fact that nobody can dispute. And here's my analogy, and I use kind of strange ones, but bear with me. If you're in a relationship and someone says, I want to take a break for five years, I think usually that's not a good thing. So if Tabor is so fabulous in Colorado, why did the voters need to step in and say, we need a break? And I could go into some things at some point about what the governor actually had down for budget cuts that would come if referendum C had not been passed, but I'm going to hold on that. One of the other things I wanted to say in responding to what Scott was talking about, about having a voice. You know, I think that democracy is already alive and well in Cape Elizabeth if you go to a town council meeting, and I don't think you need Tabor to do it. The other thing that you really should know is, is that elections in Cape Elizabeth, and you can do the math by yourself, you can weigh about six pieces of paper in an envelope and find out how much that costs to mail, and then you can call the town clerk and say, how much does an election cost? And what you're going to find is, is that in order for you to have control through Tabor, it will cost Cape Elizabeth $8,116 every single time you take a vote out to the public. So that's... That is a fact that you can call and you can get those numbers uh, on your own. The other thing I want to take exception to is the actual, on, um, on Bill and Scott's website, on the Heritage Policy website, they had an estimate of what Tabor, if Tabor had started in Maine in 1992, it would have cut approximately $470 million out of the general fund. I believe that came right off your website. So I want to talk to you about what, is that, what do those numbers mean? What does $470 million buy in Maine? It buys things like universities and community colleges, the budget, and this is over a period of 13 years, $241 million. Uh, state police and public safety, $19 million. Veterans and emergency management, $5 million. Homestead property exemption, $32 million. Maine and State Museum, $1.5 million. I can go on and on. So here's the question. What are you going to cut? You, this is not just about efficiency, not when you're talking about $470 million cut. So you pick a program, the program that might not be important to that woman in the aqua shirt may be very important to the man in the plaid shirt. Thank you. Thank you, Phyllis. That concludes the first part of our program. We will take a 10-minute break during which the, the um, Thomas Memorial Library Board of Trustees will collect questions. We'll come back in 10 minutes with questions for our panelists. Please don't go away. Okay, well, I think we have some excellent questions and certainly enough to keep us going for our allotted half hour and far beyond that if we wanted to. So thank you to everyone who submitted questions. There was a huge number submitted, far more than we can select. Uh, actually, to present to the panel, the Library Board of Trustees has called out a number of excellent ones. Um, I will start through those now, and again, um, I'll select two people um, who I think might be best suited to answer the particular question to be presented, and we'll ask that they uh, each take two minutes. And let's start with um, this question. Um, can you clarify the intent of the Taxpayer Bill of Rights regarding when and what fees and taxes will need to be approved by voters. And why don't we uh, ask Jim Cohen and Paul LePage uh, to answer this. And Jim, um, as mayor of Portland, if you'd like to go first on this. And again, the question is, can you clarify the intent of the Taxpayer Bill of Rights regarding when and what fees and taxes will need to be approved by voters. Thank you, David, and I, I think from what I heard earlier, Mayor LePage and I are in agreement that the particular section of Tabor which calls for a voter referendum on fees is a flawed section of Tabor. It's one of the major reasons I oppose Tabor, but it's half of what Tabor requires. 
the newspaper today, Bob Frank, did an excellent uh, analysis of what Tabor says, and I happen to agree with that analysis, which is some number of fees and taxes do require approval. I think the better interpretation is that any increase in the property tax rate needs to go out to the voters. I also think that the better interpretation is that most of the fees, or at least a number of the fees that are currently on the books in most municipalities for recreation programs, dog licenses, jet port fees, road opening permits, and the list goes on and on. Uh, the better interpretation from the very ballot question which says to approve all fees and taxes before there's an increase, that that's what it means. However, we also know it's ambiguous, which means before we even get to that answer, we're going to be mired in court. In Colorado, Tabor was mired in court for years working out those differences. Maine's laws are a little different. This is an import from Colorado. There was no effort to try to make it work within the existing Maine statutes, which is why it's only, it's only 4,000 words instead of uh, a longer, because it didn't fit within Maine law. So I believe every year, in order just to keep services flat, and again, I'll refer to the chart behind me, that green line is the spending limits. In order to even reach those spending limits, some level of fees and, uh, and, and taxes need to be increased just to meet those allowed revenue increases every year, which means we're going to have to vote every single year on those fees and taxes in Portland. That's just a lost $100,000 of administrative cost every single year, and that's unfortunate. Thank you, Jim. Paul, as the mayor of Waterville. Well, as the mayor of Waterville, I would say, that, and I would agree with Jim, that that is the one part of the law that I find a little bit cumbersome. But I will also say, we, I've heard a number of times today that you have to go to, to uh, <clears throat> a referendum every year. That's not true. Only if you increase the revenue and the, ta and the fees. Now, if that portion was out of it, I'm certain that the overwhelming majorities of the state of Maine, the, the taxpayers in the state of Maine would vote for this bill. I think that is the one thing that is cumbersome. But as I said earlier, I'm not ready to throw the baby out with the bathwater. In the city of Waterville, the last three years, we have not increased revenues. I mean, we've, uh, we have not increased our taxes or our fees. We've reduced them. We have not impacted any services whatsoever. And we've met, in, in fact, we've increased our, our uh, funding, our fund balances, and we've fixed a number of roads that had been deteriorating over a number of years. When Penny Olson lived in Waterville, when, and she served on council with me, we kept being told that we'd lose our cars and the potholes. Well, those roads were all been fixed, including the one that she lived on. Thank you. Thank you, Paul and Jim. Um, here's a question that I'd like to present to our two economists, Scott Moody and Charlie Colgan. Um, and Scott, if you'd like to try answering this first. If Tabor passes, why is it written that all levels of government, with the exception of the legislature, will be bound by its provisions? How is that going to help curb government spending when Augusta can do whatever it wants to do? Well, I find it quite disturbing when opponents are out there saying that the state is going to ignore the will of the people so blatantly. Um, I would just like to point out that the very same arguments were made uh, in regards to term limits and campaign finance. Uh, the legislators are abiding themselves by that, and quite frankly, I think if there's one law that legislators would not want to abide by, that would be term limits, and uh, they would have violated the will of the people a long time ago. Um, uh, before the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. So I don't think that argument holds any weight. Well, the reason that the legislature, that this does not bind the legislature is because it is settled constitutional principle in Maine that one legislature cannot bind another by statute. Um, Colorado's uh, Tabor was a constitutional amendment. Um, all bills enacted at referendum in Maine are simply statutes enacted just as if the legislature enacted them, and uh, all statutes can be changed by the legislature. Scott's quite right that the uh, legislature tends not to um, uh, adjust greatly the um, 
statutes enacted by the people at referendum, but it does adjust them. It, for example, in LD1, um, agreed on a timetable to implement the move to 55% funding of uh, local education. Um, it has adjusted many other uh, cases of uh, b uh, bills enacted at referendum, and we'll have to do so here because uh, there are conflicts between this law and existing statutes. So um, the legislature will have to do some things in this. They will, uh, as a political matter, probably try to adhere to the spirit of it, but they will and have the constitutional, both the constitutional obligation and the constitutional freedom to adjust it as they see fit. Thank you, Scott and Charlie. I'd like um, Bill Becker and Phyllis Cohn to try this one. Um, Phyllis, I'll let you have first crack at it. Um, when a proposed budget does not exceed a town's inflation plus population growth spending limit, but still requires an increase in the property tax rate, does that budget require a supermajority in the council and voter approval? In short, which limit is controlling, spending or revenue? If the revenue limit controls, doesn't this mean that most town budgets would require voter approval almost every year? I, yes, I'm probably not the best person to give the most comprehensive answer to that, to be honest with you. Um, okay. Can I defer to Jim, sure. perhaps, you, you to can, do that? We can do that. Jim, uh, okay. you want to take Sorry. it? Sure. The, the short answer to that question is yes. Uh, the, way, the way it works is that in order to get any increase in revenue, any increase in fees or taxes, uh, the, the very ballot question, I'll read you the ballot question, it says, do you want to limit increases in state and local government to the rate of inflation plus population growth and to require voter approval for all tax and fee increases. The very language of that ballot question, which was prepared by the Secretary of State after reading uh, this 4,000 word uh, Taxpayer Bill of Rights, I think is very clear. My reading of the language itself is very clear that you would need to do that. So and again, I'll report, refer to the, the uh, chart behind me, the green line being the Tabor expenditure limitations, which are framed as revenue. Uh, says this is what you're allowed to raise in revenues, but the other provision says in order to get those revenues, you've got to go out and get voter approval. So under that scenario that was raised in the question, you would need to get voter approval. And, and that's going to be just about every year because every year you're going to have a little bit of an increase. We've heard from the supporters uh, that it won't cause cuts. There'll be a slight increase every year in what needs to be expended in, or in order to get that slight increase, even if it's a teeny increase uh, in revenues to meet those expenditure limits, you got to go out to the voters. In Portland, that's $100,000 cost to get that approval. Expect tens of thousands of dollars just to have the vote, then you got to run the campaign around it and have a very engaged public to make sure they understand it. And that's just to stay even. That has nothing to do with whether we go above the expenditure limits. Thank you, Jim. Bill? No. Um, the answer to the question is no. It does not require. The, the, the law changes to a revenue limit at the local level for the very purpose so as to not have to send it out to the voters every time there's a, basically a housekeeping adjustment on the mill rate to deal with revenue increase. So at the local level, it's a revenue limit that says you can grow by inflation plus population. That revenue grows. That's what your expenditures are. Revenue me matches expenditures at the local level. You know, and this idea that somehow that we're going to have to um, that the municipality is going to pay for the election. I mean, let's, let's think about it. The municipality already pays for one, if not two, elections every year. Uh, this law, the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, actually says, and up to one election per year at, at the municipal level will be paid for by the state. And the state has already established what the fiscal note will be for that, what the cost of the Secretary of State's office is, and what the cost for each uh, one of those municipal elections. I mean, basically, the budget set in the spring if there is a request for an override, which we would argue that there shouldn't be all the time, uh, if there's a request for the override, that would go on to the June ballot when we almost always have a June referendum on some issue, whether it be bonds, whether it be primaries, whether it be uh, some other local issue. It's already there. And the voters would receive in the mail some analysis 
by the supporters of the spending increase and by the opponents of the spending increase to say, this is a good use of your money or this isn't a good use of your money. The same thing that happens for the legislature right now. They get something called a fiscal note, which tells them what the impact is going to be at the legislative level. The citizens in each of our communities have the right to have that same sort of information to make sure that they're making an informed decision on whether or not this is a good use of their tax revenue or an increase in spending. Thank you, Bill. This next question I'd like to go back to our two economists for, um, Scott Moody and Charlie Colgan. Given the fact that tax expenditure legislation has been pro the tax expenditure legislation has been promised to residents of Maine at many discrete times over the past. What is the single overriding reason that it has not happened? Um, I think the question means, given the fact that tax expenditure limitation legislation has been promised to residents of Maine at many discrete times in the past. What is the single overriding reason that it has not happened? Charlie, can we start with you on that? Well, I guess I'd have to disagree with the premise of the question. Um, the, uh, the legislature enacted a, uh, an expenditure limitation um, in 2003 based on um, economic growth and then reenacted um, an expenditure limitation last year in, in so-called LD1, um, which they extended to um, local governments. Um, and uh, so we're now in the second year of um, that expenditure limitation. Um, and uh, as uh, Scott points out in, in, in his research, um, Tabor over time will, will take a substantial amount of time to, to be fully effective to defined as getting us down to the national uh, tax burden rate. Um, so the, the, these things do take time um, to work, primarily, incidentally, because of the fact that most of the expenditure limitations mostly work by shaving off growth in period, uh, off revenue growth in periods when the economy is expanding and pushing revenue growth ahead at fairly rapid rates. What, the, what Tabor does and, and the expenditure limitations do is they shave that growth that occurs in periods of expansion. Um, they may not have much effect at all in periods of recession or in periods of very slow growth such as we're in now, um, which is one of the reasons why you don't necessarily see the expenditure limitation um, having a big effect yeah, it's because, at least certainly at the state level, is because right now the economy and revenues are expanding at a relatively slow rate um, compared to the expenditure limitation. Well, there are currently 30 tax and expenditure limitations in place uh, around the nation. And when we did our research, we consulted with national experts uh, on what's called TELS uh, throughout the nation, and the reason why we used the Colorado Taxpayer Bill of Rights as our platform to build upon was because it did as advertised. It actually kept their tax burden in check. Now, I find it a little bit ironic that Colorado was the one to invent the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. They've always been a moderate to low tax state for as far back as the eye can see, whereas Maine, we should have invented the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. We're the one who needs it the most. Um, you know, there, uh, so we need a uh, uh, something that is actually going to do as it said. Now, there are many reasons why LD1 won't work, and, and one of those reasons, for example, is, you know, uh, Mayor Cohen's showing you all these growth formulas and everything, but in LD1, all it requires is a 50% majority vote to override uh, their growth uh, allowances. Now, last I checked, budgets are passed on a 50% majority vote, so LD1 isn't a limitation so much as a suggestion, and it has no teeth, and in fact, the, the bill that, they, that they're now backing is to put teeth into LD1. They recognize the flaws in LD1. It will not work. Nobody bothered to check to see if the 2015 date in LD1 would actually, uh, whether LD1 would actually get us there to the national average by 2015. My study is the only one I know of that puts circumstantial evidence that shows LD1 will not work. When are we going to know this? 2015, 2016, 2017? By then, Maine will be further behind the eight ball. And uh, in fact, it, it may be too late because by 2030, uh, that's what demographic 
projections are showing this demographic tsunami. We need the biggest, broadest tax base, the most vibrant economy uh, as soon as possible, which is why we need a taxpayer bill of rights today, not tomorrow. Thank you, Scott and Charlie. Uh, Phyllis, mm -hmm. I'd like you and Paul LePage to handle this one. In Colorado, 44 <laughs> of 64 counties have waived refunds and 173 of 178 school districts have voted to waive limits. Is this not evidence that the Taxpayer Bill of Rights does not work? Thank you for that question. That is a resounding yes. And the difference here in Maine is, is that we don't have the right on the local level to waive it. That's when you go do the uh, two-thirds majority in the town council, the 500-word analysis on pro and con, the fiscal analysis get, that gets mailed to you, and then you go and vote. So the answer is definitely yes, I think it does. The other thing is, in talking about Colorado, um, I wanted to just point out, and I don't know how many of you have seen the Governor Owens ads. Anybody seen the Governor Owens ads where he's, okay. Um, Governor Owens actually supported the suspension of the Tabor rebate. And one of the reasons he did that is uh, he was recommending $256 million in budget cuts that would have included things like closing 11 state parks, and this, this came out of the governor's office. This was his budget cut recommendations. Um, he, they needed to save $12 million by eliminating state support for the Colorado Indigent Care Program for uninsured hospital patients, cutting financial aid by $7.7 million, capping the inmate population in prison, so where are they going to go? eliminating vehicle emissions programs, which has to do with our environment, recommending instant, um, recommended eliminating instant criminal background checks for gun buyers, and cutting $10 million from job placement centers. So Colorado realized, was Tabor somewhat successful in Colorado? Yeah, it was. It did some things. It did hold things steady. But something was not working right there that brought the governor, who rallied Republicans, businessmen, everyone alike, who saw that Tabor was a problem and that they needed a time out there. So the answer is yes, it was not good for Colorado. Thank you, Phyllis. Paul? I, I, I don't see why the answer is yes, because it's a constitutional amendment, and Tabor is not a constitutional amendment. If it's passed, and even if it was a constitutional amendment, I believe the taxpayer rules. If the taxpayer feels that he doesn't want to get the rebates, he doesn't have to get the rebates. I'll give you an example. In the city of Waterville, we recently changed up our, uh, our charter. As the mayor, I said, I don't need a salary. They were paying $10,000. $10,000, I think it's the second highest paid mayor in the state of Maine. I said, we're not the second highest city, so why don't we just reduce it? Let's go proportionally to what it should be. So I said, $3,600 enough. No, they voted to make it $5,000. So I tried to give it back, didn't want to give it back. That wasn't the taxpayer, because the taxpayer was all behind me on that. They, everybody was saying, hooray for you. So the city council wouldn't do it, which I thought was ridiculous. But so basically, the taxpayer rules. What's wrong with going back to the taxpayer? If you don't want to get the refund, you want to put it in a rainy day, you want to change the formula, we can go back. In our city, you know, I've heard all day about why Tabor is bad and why Tabor is good. The fact of the matter is, the real world is our state and local governments efficient in Maine. Now, I'll tell you, we, we cut our budget 10% over the last three years. I maintain that we could cut 1% out of the state government, 1%, and get rid of the structural gap. Incidentally, I went to my employers recently at a board meeting, and I told them, I have a structural gap in my lifestyle. I need an additional $5 million. And we chuckled and went back to work. That's what we need to do in Maine. The local governments and the state should go to work. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Bill Becker, if you and Jim Cohen would uh, respond to this one, and Bill, I'll let you go first. 
the Taxpayer Bill of Rights encourages lawsuits against towns in the state, including payment of legal fees to the prevailing side. Isn't that just an endless make-work bill for Taxpayer Bill of Rights lawyers at taxpayer expense? What other lawsuits against government entities allow this? Well, I'm not a lawyer, so I won't, wouldn't even benefit by, by that, even, that statement being true. Um, I don't, you know, I've heard a lot from, from the legal community that somehow this is going to enhance uh, the law. Sorry, Finn. I've heard a lot that this is going to enhance legal, legal lawsuits, but we heard the same thing 10 years ago when we were talking about term limits. Oh, it's going to be in front of the courts. Oh, it's going to do this. Oh, it's going to do that in terms of the legal challenges. Yeah, there might be some lawsuits. Yeah, there might be some challenges. And individually, the reason that that's, that specific provision was put into the law was to be able to have some sort of ability for the citizen to petition its government through the, for, through the courts, not just through the legislative process. So, I mean, the number of times that this is going to, that this would even happen is greatly exaggerated. Lawyers know that if you win a lawsuit, you usually end up getting your legal fees paid for by the other side. And that's, that's part of, that's part, part of, I mean, it can be part of the settlement. It might not be always, but it can be part of the settlement. I mean, it, it basically puts into to the, to the clause, the, into the law, an ability for the legal challenge to be there for individuals or communities that do not feel as if the law is being adhered to. I mean, but, but the idea that somehow there's gonna, we're going to be racked in lawsuits and mired in lawsuits, that's the usual claim that we hear when laws like this come forward. Jim. Thank you. Uh, I've certainly heard a lot of scare tactics quoted by uh, some of the folks uh, from the Heritage Center in terms of what our tax burden really is and how this thing really works. And uh, I do happen to be afflicted with the curse of, of being a lawyer. Uh, I know Mr. Becker is, is not a lawyer, but he did draft uh, the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. Uh, it was imported from, from Colorado, where it I believe it was also drafted by somebody who didn't try to fit the law into Colorado statutes. We've now taken something that didn't fit well into Colorado and was heavily litigated. We've now brought it to Maine with similar uh, a lack of effort to try to fit it within existing Maine statutes. That's very different than how LD1 was put together. LD1 was put together in a collaborative fashion with some of Maine's largest businesses and the business community working collaboratively with people who understood existing Maine law to avoid all of those lawsuits. Now the fact is, in a lawsuit, it is not traditional American jurisprudence for the winner to get attorney's fees. That's very rare that that's the case, but yet that's here. It's one more example of how the Taxpayer Bill of Rights is structured in a way that's not balanced, uh, in a way that's not reasonable, and that's why I think we should start with a platform that does work. Uh, a platform like LD1, which is sensibly crafted, which is understandable, you know what you get with it. The Maine State Chamber uh, has already done an analysis that said it was moving Maine in the right direction after one year, uh, and it's only been in place for one year. We should give it a chance to work. We know it's not generating a lot of lawsuits because it's carefully crafted. This is just one more formula to make it really impossible to get anything done. So let's start with a framework that works. If we need to tweak that framework, for, for example, because there's not enough teeth in it, which is the one complaint that I've heard with it, let's fix that. We've got the coalition to get it done. Let's not be mired in the courts, paying out lots of uh, attorney's fees. That's not the way to solve Maine's problems. Thank you, Bill and Jim. I'd like to go back to our two economists with this question. Um, Charlie Colgan, if you would address it first and then we'll let Scott Moody follow. The question has been made that the Taxpayer Bill of Rights will result in better health care for Maine citizens. Please explain how this initiative will do that if you agree that it indeed will result in a change for the better. I'm going to let Scott go first on that one. <laughs> okay. Scott? Uh, the Taxpayer Bill of Rights has not specifically addressed health care. Um, in fact, that's one of the things about, health, about the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. You hear the opponents always saying that this program is going to be cut, that program is going to be cut. 
This is going to suffer. Um, in fact, the Taxpayer Bill of Rights does no such thing. It'll still be up to our elected officials to decide how the composition of spending will occur. It's only up to the growth allowances. Everything is still business as usual, how you set your budget, uh, how you spend your money. It's only when you exceed those growth allowances that the override provisions kick in, and for a very good reason. Again, we're, you've got to justify this justification why taxes should grow faster than your income. And, uh, and that's, the, that's the reason for that. Uh, so that's my answer. Thank you, Scott. Uh, of, all, of all the arguments I've heard in favor of Tabor, that one has not arisen. Um, uh, I, I guess I could only point out that, that um, um, there, um, uh, I, I guess if, if Tabor were enacted as, um, uh, as envisioned, the argument would be something like there would be fewer, there may be, if the, if the legislature chose it, there could be fewer dollars um, available from the public, on the, on the publicly funded health care side, or the same number of dollars for publicly funded health care and fewer dollars for something else. Um, but, um, the, uh, but people would have more money in terms of the tax rebates that were um, required by Tabor and so might be able to devote that to their own health care spending or to health insurance or something like that. That's certainly possible as one of many potential outcomes between the effects, the, the, the distribution of the spending changes uh, resulting from Tabor and the revenue uh, re uh, reimbursement changes resulting from Tabor, but I don't think that you can say that it would occur as a blanket matter across the state. Thank you, Scott and Charlie. Um, I'd like to come back to Phyllis and Bill with this question. Um, Bill, I'll let you go first on this one. Since property taxes are assessed at the local level, why should this measure be enacted statewide rather than allowing individual communities to enact guidelines that address their specific situations? Because Maine's state and local tax burden is a statewide issue. And yes, there are communities that have done a good job of restraining government growth at the local level. But I would look at the state government of Maine. Two years ago, the biennial budget was $5.3 billion. This biennium, the budget is $6 billion. It's grown by 10%, $600 million in just two years. This is a statewide problem. I mean, the, the, I've heard that argument made, and I guess I would say, well, then those communities that elect Governor Baldacci can have him as governor. Those communities that elect Chandler Woodcock can have him as governor. It's a statewide problem. Citizens initiatives are passed as a statewide referendum to address a statewide issue. Turnpike widening that didn't necessarily impact tremendously the folks living in Washington County may have had a tremendous impact on those in the southern part of the state. Our citizens initiatives are passed by a majority vote of the voters in the state to address statewide problems. The state instituted an income tax in 1969. I would argue that there were some communities that wouldn't have favored an income tax. Nonetheless, they pay the income tax today. This is a statewide issue that needs to be addressed with a statewide policy solution. Uh, as I've mentioned, I'm, I'm definitely from away, and I'm new to Maine, but I live next door to Town Hall. And something I've noticed when there's a big budget hearing is, is the parking lot is overflowing. And I think that's because here in Maine, and, and as I said, I, I really coming to Maine, I didn't know how local government worked, and I've learned that you already have a say at the local level. Um, my understanding is, I think, and maybe the superintendent can correct me, there was a big budget battle um, around to try to keep the education budget somewhere around just 3%. I'm, I'm not exactly sure of the exact figures. But I know that there was a huge budget battle for education because people in CAPE really value the education that their children and their grandchildren get. And they like being able to go to the town council and have a say. And if Tabor were enacted, and this is exactly the problem, it takes away your ability to do that for a couple reasons. One, you're now down to the two-thirds supermajority where a small majority can thwart 
uh, your ability to have the control that you already have, frankly. And then the other piece is uh, it does cost money. And the question I passed before on, I actually could have answered in part of the, the piece with taxes. Because what happens at the local level is that if you need to raise a library fine by 10 cents, let's say, that has to go to the uh, local governing body and they have to vote two-thirds that they want to do it. Then they have to send out those things I mentioned before, the two 500-word uh, pro and con and the fiscal analysis. And as I had indicated before, then you've got to vote on it. And that cost is almost, well, it's over $8,000 every time you want to do that. Well, you can already vote now. You can go to a town council meeting and you can work with your town council and you can make changes at your local level without Tabor imposing on you limitations that really change the way that your local governments work. Thank you, Phyllis. Um, I think we'll make this our last question and I'd like to ask our two mayors to address this. Uh, Paul, if you'd like to go first and we'll let Jim Cohen follow up. If the Taxpayer Bill of Rights is voted in, it then goes to the state, to Augusta, to review and refine it. Then, does it come back to the voters? If we vote no, meaning if the voters do not approve the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, will it come back again next year? I would say that if it's passed and goes to the legislature and they fine tune it, no, it does not come back. There's no rationale for it to come back. It would be enacted. <clears throat> Secondly, if it's defeated, whether it's in a year or two years, absolutely, there'll be another bill. Uh, the f first time was Pileski, and then the chamber came out at the last minute, as they're doing this time and said, oh, Pulaski's bad for Maine. We've got a better alternative. Nothing ever happened. LD1 came out. LD1, I don't know. I will tell you, LD1 is working in Waterville. But I will tell you one thing about LD1 that nobody has mentioned today. LD1 has put the largest tax increase into communities and onto business that we have had in decades. The Homestead Exemption Act that the state passed, it used to be at $7,000 and the state paid for it. They increased it to 13, but they only picked up half of it. The city of Waterville had, we could have reduced our taxes by over two mills. However, the Homestead Exemption that we are assessed is half a mill. It's half a million dollars. It's a little over half a million dollars that we had to pick up because of the legislation. So the tax burden is great. Yes, it will come back. It will come back in another form. It was Pileski, Tabor, and who knows what it will be called next time. But it will come back if it doesn't pass because the citizens of Maine just simply can't afford the taxes. Thank you, Paul. Jim? The people of Maine want spending limits that work. We want effective and we want reasonable spending limits. And the choice that's before us is, do we want a system that works but maybe doesn't have the teeth that we want, or do we want another system that has plenty of teeth but doesn't work? And that's the problem that, that we have in front of us. Now, on this panel, we happen to have the drafters of spending limits of Tabor and Mr. Becker, and we have the, uh, the drafter of the, uh, the Chamber's tax plan right here. And I can tell you, we worked very hard to make sure that it was a system that works. I'll give you some, and, and so if we think that we can pass Tabor and get the legislature to fix it and we're going to have another crack at it, I would say guess again. Because I heard Mr. Becker on the radio last week say there, that he would not support changes uh, to, to LD1, I mean, sorry, to, uh, to Tabor. I heard Scott Moody say last week uh, that, uh, in fact, L, uh, Tabor should be enshrined in the Constitution. So any flaws that we identify in Tabor, in fact, are going to be the flaws that we would be needing to live with. If we want to fix the problem, let's put some teeth into LD1. Let me give you some examples of flaws. If you spend more in your sewer department in order to comply with a federal mandate, 
under Tabor, you'd have to ratchet down education spending. If you wanted to give a business a tax break to grow in your town by giving back some money through a TIF, that would cause a ratchet down somewhere else in the budget. Not true under LD1. So it's, it's a broader balloon effect that occurs. So those are some real flaws. LD1 has a stable measure of growth. Tabor has a yo-yo effect. And again, we're going to have to live with all those flaws because if we vote for it, what we're telling the legislature is, yep, the sensible measures that maybe worked but didn't have teeth, let's throw all those out. What we really want are the measures that don't make sense. That's what we want to go with. We heard a moment ago that the legislature has kept its promise on, on term limits and, and other citizen-initiated referendum. I would think that the legislature would take the will of the people if they vote for Tabor to mean that's exactly what they want. So if you vote for Tabor, you get it, warts and all. Thank you, Paul and Jim. Let's go to our one minute closings and we'll go in reverse order of the opening presentations, which means that Phyllis Cohn will go first. And go very quickly. Uh, I want to thank you all for uh, coming in today. This is very, very important. We all want comprehensive tax reform. We all agree to that. The disagreement comes in, is Tabor going to solve the problems that we face? Uh, we say, no, it won't. Um, I know we're really frustrated. The State Chamber of Commerce really wanted to endorse Tabor, but when they dug into the details, they said this is bad for communities, it's bad for business, it's bad for Maine. Now the Press Herald did endorse Tabor, but if you read that endorsement, you'll see it came along with a bunch of caveats, uh, particularly about the two-thirds vote. I know that Mary Adams, who's heading up the um, pro-Tabor coalition, feels adamant about the fact that that two-thirds piece is fundamental to Tabor. So I want to encourage you to think that if you are going to vote on Tabor, thinking it's going to make changes afterwards, that is not it, it, it's not necessarily going to happen. You need to vote on what's in front of you. Am I t done? Oh, I get three. <laughs> you had the wrong side. Uh, here's my last analogy. I've been single for, I was single for about six years. I was a single mom and I was raising a son and it was really difficult and hard. And I wanted it to be over and I wanted to meet somebody. And I had a lot of opportunities in there to get married but they weren't the right person for me. They just weren't. And I knew that if I waited long enough that I'd find somebody who I could make a commitment to who would make one to me and it would be the best choice for me. And it took a little bit longer, but I got what I wanted. And I leave you with those words and urge you to vote no for Tabor. Vote no on question one. Thank you. Thank you, Phyllis. Bill Becker. Yeah, thanks again for the opportunity to be with you. Um, look, the problem also is embodied in our education system. 40 years ago, we had 240,000 kids in our K-12 through school system. This year, we just opened with less than 200,000. We've lost 40,000 kids in about 40 years. The projection from the state planning office is that we're going to lose another 20,000. The reality is that there are fewer people in working age families and working, age, and working class jobs putting their kids in our K-12 through school system. That's the fundamental problem that we're dealing with. I respect the fact that Jim's an, a, a lawyer and not an economist, but I would argue that an economist would find a way to strengthen the economy. And that's what we're trying to do, is strengthen the economy of the state of Maine. You know, the other issue that I want to touch on is uh, this, this fundamental issue um, of tax cuts. There are three different ways that tax cuts will occur under the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. Rate gets lowered, as it did in Colorado, from 5% to 4.63 to, to, uh, to 4.75 to 4.63. There are rebates, which is real tax relief. And as a percentage of our income, as our incomes rise, our tax burden will decrease. That's what it's all about. Thank, Thank you, Bill. <laughs> Jim Cohen. The work of tax reform is hard work. In Portland and in many communities, we've worked hard. We've tried to find efficiencies in our health care. We've tried to manage our overtime costs. We recently worked with Cape Elizabeth and Westbrook and six communities to develop a regional coalition to try to reduce the cost of government. Those are the real solutions. That's what we need to be focusing on. Now, I like Bill. He's a good guy. The fact is, he wrote a flawed bill. That flawed bill was flawed in, in Colorado, which prompted the business leaders of Colorado to write back and say, Tabor is a proven failure in Colorado, and Maine can expect many of the same problems. Maine's version is a little worse because it prevents municipalities from opting out. 
So we're stuck with the problem. The legislature can get out of it because it's not constitutional, but not us here at home. So if you want to vote for something that's going to take away your local control, hand control to a minority, not give you any tax reform, and maybe impact the very services you want, vote for Tabor. But if you want something better, you want the better match, Let's take the good platform we have, which is LD1, let's put some teeth into it, let's work with the coalition we have, we will get there. Thank you, Jim. Charlie Colgan. A um, couple of quick points. First, let me update a uh, couple of numbers that Bill was giving. He noted that from 1990 to 2000, Maine grew by about 3.7%, that we were the fourth slowest growing state in the country. Since 2000, we've added approximately the same population that we did over the entire decade of the 1990s, uh, about 46,000 people since 2000, about 47,000 in the 1990s. Um, we were just behind New Hampshire and almost equal to Massachusetts in population growth. Secondly, um, there are a, a lot of reasons to um, vote for a Tabor, uh, depending upon how you view the spending taxation balance. But the one thing I would argue, uh, and, and one thing that economists absolutely, fundamentally um, believe in, um, uh, Scott and I will differ on the effects of taxation on economic growth in Maine, but I think economists do agree that there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. If you vote to get taxes back, you're going to give up something in public services, and you're going to have to decide how you want to balance that. Thank you, Charlie. Scott Moody. Well, throughout the history of the United States, no state has taxed and spent itself into prosperity. America is great today because we unleashed the free market system for the first time in history. Think about what having the highest tax burden, one of the highest tax burdens in the nation really means. It also means we have one of the smallest free markets in the nation, which means we've hampered our business community, our business leaders, to do what they are supposed to do, which is generate wealth create a dynamic economy so that our children will have jobs and income to stay in the state of Maine. Now, fundamentally, if you believe, as I do, that people ultimately vote with their feet, let's just look at Colorado for a second. Since they've had a Taxpayer Bill of Rights in 1992, 1.5 million people have moved into the state. That's more people than currently live in all of Maine. Now, to me, that's a testament that Colorado is doing something right, and, and the Maine Heritage Policy Center certainly believes that the Taxpayer Bill of Rights that they enacted is a big part of that, what is a big part of what they're doing right. Thank you, Scott. And the last word by a random cut of the cards goes to Mayor Paula Page. Thank you. I think we find ourselves here for a couple of reasons. One is we have a legislature that for 30 years has generated gridlock. You have two sides. If you take a look at the Mary report, you have, from 0 to 30, you have the Democrats. From 70 to 100, you have the Republicans. I was counted the other night, there are four people in our state legislature between 30 and 70. So that means the people aren't willing to work with each other. MMA came out of the campaign against the Tabor bill, and they used fear. That is my biggest objection. I'm clearly not saying that Tabor's perfect. I'm saying... Tabor has some problems, it needs to be tweaked, but it's, you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And finally, people in Augusta over 30 years have never shown the political will to do what's right for the people of Maine. So, in closing, don't vote out of fear, vote out of hope for the future. On behalf of the members of the Cape Elizabeth Taxpayer Bill of Rights Task Force, the Board of Directors of the Thomas Memorial Library, and all of the citizens of Cape Elizabeth, I want to extend my thanks to all of our panelists for taking the time to join us here in Cape Elizabeth on a Sunday afternoon. In case anyone thinks it's easy to participate on a panel like this, don't be deceived. These folks all did their homework to make it look easy, but there was nothing easy about it. As a result of their hard work, they've left us all better informed as we head to the polls on November 7 to vote yes or no on this citizen initiative. 
And for that, we are grateful to all.